the same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. Thank you. Since Professor Weber has evoked the historical moment of Hitler's Germany, let me begin by noting that our speaker, Professor Jeffrey Hartman, who was born in Frankfurt in 1929, escaped the Nazis at the age of nine when he was sent to England on a kinder transport. After the war, he attended Queens College in New York and Yale University in Connecticut, where he eventually taught for almost 40 years retiring as Sterling Professor of English and Comparative Literature in 1997. In a short memoir, Professor Hartman speculated about what life might have been like given the vitality of German Jewish thought before the destruction if the Holocaust had not occurred. I would surely have stayed in Germany and studied directly with many whom I admired, he wrote, listing Buber, Kassira, Panofsky, Adorno, Benjamin, Fromm, Simon, Glatzer, Heschel, Arendt. If it is impossible to think of the American academic landscape in the second half of the 20th century without most of those names, I suggest that it's equally difficult to imagine the terrain of English and comparative literature, literary studies, literary theory, and many fields beyond without the work that Jeffrey Hartman published since his first book in 1954. Many of his books, and there are more than 20, along with hundreds of essays, individually have had more of an impact on their fields than most authors have in their entire oeuvre. Think of the unmediated vision, Wordsworth's poetry, beyond formalism, the fate of reading, criticism in the wilderness, just to name a few. And this does not include the remarkable work of the last decade, such as The Longest Shadow and the Aftermath of the Holocaust, The Fateful Question of Culture, A Critic's Journey, Literary Reflections, and just this month, A Scholar's Tale, Intellectual Journey of a Displaced Child of Europe. A collection of his work, the Jeffrey Hartman Reader, received the 2006 Truman Capote Award for Literary Criticism. Indeed, Hartman influenced a generation of scholars and teachers by influencing the poetic and critical canons that have defined both our literary imaginations and our critical sensibilities. By foregrounding the role of the critic, and by framing and informing the very questions that we find interesting and the ways of reading that we find compelling. In this sense, Hartman might be said to have had an influence on readers and students who never even knew that they were studying in his shadow. In the context of this inaugural Wittgenstein lecture and our new UC Santa Barbara Jewish Studies initiative, I should also note that Professor Hartman was instrumental in starting the Judaic Studies program at Yale. When he first started teaching at Yale in 1955, Yale College still had policies that restricted the number of Jewish students. He went on to co-found the Fortunoff Video Archives of Holocaust Testimonies at Yale, for which he serves as project director and faculty advisor. I saw firsthand how he helped to open up an intellectual space for Holocaust studies at Yale and consequently in the American Academy during the 1980s and 1990s. Professor Hartman was named a 1997 laureate of the National Foundation for Jewish Culture for his contribution to Jewish thought, and he served as a special advisor to the chairman of the United States Holocaust Memorial Council. 
Now, I don't have time to list more than a few of Professor Hartman's many honors and awards, Guggenheim, ACLS, NEH fellowships, membership in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, corresponding fellow of the British Academy, book prizes, endowed chairs, etc. Nor can I do more than allude to his many acts of kindness during the many years in which we were colleagues when I learned a great deal from his intellectual example as well as from his writing. But to conclude this introduction, I'd like to read a sentence that Professor Hartman has cited in his writing from Franz Rosenzweig. Hebrew, knowing no word for reading, that does not mean learning as well, has given this, the secret of all literature, away. Let me just read that again. Hebrew, knowing no word for reading, that does not mean learning as well, has given this, the secret of literature, away. Jeffrey Hartman's work has always been about the reading that is learning, which is to say, interpretation. If for Hartman, the text is always central, it is because for him, close reading, the close attention to the language and diction and rhetoric of a text never closes the text down, Rather, it opens the text up to the voice of the critic, to philosophical and theoretical interrogation, to the psychoanalytic reflections that interrogate both author and reader, to the question of culture and all its predicaments, to the deep resonance of experience, whether, recollect, whether recollected in tranquility or in trauma, to the experience, both spoken and unspoken, that inhabits language and culture. This is what has made his work singular, compelling, challenging, and important. This is the secret that Jeffrey Hartman gives away, the fate and promise of reading. The title of Professor Hartman's George J. Wittgenstein lecture tonight is Shoah Literature, the Universal Aspect, Please join me in welcoming Professor Jeffrey Hartman. Thank you. That, as you realize, is a hard act to follow. David Marshall, I thank you for your generous comments. And David knows that I'm not a very sentimental fellow. And so I have to say I'm very moved tonight by having been asked to give a talk in honor of Dr. Wittgenstein and the White Rose Resistance Movement. Also by the fact of recognizing once more that this university knows what the public humanities are and continues to encourage them, including, of course, Holocaust studies and Jewish studies. When Elizabeth Weber asked me to give this lecture, <clears throat> I demurred at first. I was unsure. I'm not a, a historian, I said, and I'm not a historian. Um, I would like to do something like this, but I feel the white rose um, resistance movement is not well enough known, and, and I, I just cannot uh, contribute to that. I would feel somehow not up to it. But who can resist Elizabeth Weber? <laughs> so here I am, and thankful that I am here. And I want to recount one anecdote which occurred just coincidentally. It seemed a little bit like fate. As you know, each year there is a Yom HaShoah ceremony where we commemorate, where we remember, I should say, the, the Holocaust. And this last year in New Haven, in April, I attended that ceremony as I do every year. And I saw what I see every year, six candles representing the six million. And there's usually a seventh candle, which is there for, well, the locution is different for different uh, 
communities, but basically the righteous Gentile or rescuers. Can you hear me, by the way? Okay. Instead of the seventh candle, there are six candles in a row, a little space, and then the seventh candle to, to recognize the rescuers, those who helped Jews escape, those who saved their lives. There, in addition to the six candles, the seventh candle was not there, but there was a white rose. Now, I could not find out why there was, whether that was an intentional movement, but I must say my, I didn't have to find out. There was something, some kind of poetic justice in that white rose being there. So I just wanted to tell you that one act, a, anecdote before con, continuing my main task, which is to talk to you about Shoah literature in its universal aspect. I do think that theme has a bearing on the White Rose movement in the sense that we have learned that there are commemorative communities, that commemoration cannot be isolated unto one single community. And so I feel that there is a relation between the White Rose commemoration, any commemoration, thinking about the White Rose and the rescuers, and commemorations which remember the victims of the Holocaust. Now I want to move away tonight from the recent emphasis on historical and generational differences and back towards transgenerational, transnational, and even universal aspects. One way of doing so is to concentrate on the difficulty of defining or defending the generic importance of imaginative literature, with Shoah literature as an exemplary case. Can fiction dealing with the Holocaust be justified, despite the fact that contemporary as well as later witness accounts yield more than enough pity and terror? Does that fiction have a truth of its own to supplement, even if it cannot match, the unrelenting detail and barely tolerable depictions produced by testimony and historical research. The Shoah has revived through its very shock and specificity, a distinction always evoked by creative writing, that between truth and truthiness, truthiness is opera's word for very similitude, between vrai and vraisemblable, Jorge Sempran, that is he who makes that distinction, or vrai and veridique, Charlotte Delbo makes that distinction. Aharon Appelfeld confirms the importance of that distinction as it arises from a deadly realm where everything tended towards the unbelievable rather than, as is sometimes claimed, the unrepresentable. Though his subject is the Holocaust, Appelfeld does not dilate imagination, but restrains it. And I quote him, everything was so unbelievable that one seemed oneself to be fictional. If I remained true to fact, no one could believe me. I had to remove those parts that were unbelievable from the story of my life and pre present a more credible version. Briefly stated, literature's truth must induce belief, or at least a willing suspension of disbelief. Aristotle's poetics stipulate that art must have probability, a word that points not to a statistical criterion, but to the human heart, to a vis wisdom based on human nature. The trouble in the extreme case of the Shoah is that the events constituting it are so callous and inhumane that they may produce sentiments of incredulity rather than probability. However irrefutable the evidence, the offense to memory is so great that we practice various evasions. We become, as Lawrence Lange says, deflective rather than reflective. Knowledge in this domain whether derived from history or from literature, is deeply hurtful because it slanders our humanity, our species image. 
One cannot expect, therefore, that the young and even the mature will easily overcome their disbelief or a sense of exaggeration and propaganda. How believable as non-fiction fiction is the opening of Jakob Lind's Soul of Wood. And I quote Lind, those who had no papers entitling them to live lined up to die. Lind steals the tonal matter-of-factness of fables to make us think it is a fable. For a moment, the awfulness of the reality is suspended. As both teachers and critics, we have to recognize that in addition to the negationist malicious denial, there is also a non-malicious doubt and try to find means whereby, in the face of that period's extremity, a willingness to hear and respond can be developed instead of denial and deflection. Let us then begin to deal with this issue by not underestimating either the intelligent distrust or the psychological defenses roused when people are confronted by the extraordinary brutalities of genocide and the enemies and the enormity of the attempt to exterminate every person in a certain ethnic or racial group. An additional shock comes on learning about the complicity of so many professionals and educators, Hitler's professors, as Max Weinreich called them, who colluded with Rassenwissenschaft, the pseudoscience of race and the ideological basis of the killings. I'm going to take um, a sip of water before continuing. It's okay, I can do it. Yes. I get a little overexcited, so I have to cool myself down. The problem of reception in this area are enormous. Even if, in dealing with defenses against the devastating knowledge and a blatant breach of civilized values, art is capable of evoking a powerful emotional and intellectual response, this will not be effective unless we are prepared to accept such a response also in the classroom and place it in the service of research and reflection. But does, and this is a central question, but does academic hygiene presently permit literary study to be more than a specialized training in reading skills and a utilitarian rhetoric seasoned by empathic expressions of horror and regret? This more than specialized training need not imply a diversion from literary competence by an overlay of political, ethnic, or moral sentiments. It suggests, rather, a return to qualities that keep literature a necessity for culture. We may hesitate to apply to literature about the Shoah formalistic categories of analysis, yet it was precisely the simplicity and relative coolness of such categories that strengthened their value vis-a-vis -vis the great tragedies of ancient Greece and allowed Aristotle in his poetics to establish universal criteria. It is illuminating, for example, to read Renata Lachmann on Danilo Kish and glimpse in his oeuvre an operative poetics that makes one think Holocaust literature may contain works of art that have a chance of being compared with the most significant production of the past. Indeed, despite the pain aroused by its subject, Holocaust literature requires a measure of detachment in the critical observer as well as the author. How else can it be transmitted and keep us returning to events that, being too real, tend to be repressed or tabooed? In Auschwitz, Hans Jonas, the famous scholar of Gnosticism, Hans Jonas declared in Auschwitz, more was real than is possible. 
more was real than is possible. Not that the literary arts ever had an easy time confronting what is impossible, including impossibly real. Their serious play may lend a sort of credence, a semblance of probability to almost anything. In 17th century France, Boileau gave his reluctant admiration to art for fashioning monstres agréables. He is careful at the same time to make a distinction. While accepting the monster marvels of pagan fables, he objects to their admixture with sacred Christian ver verities. One set of impossibilities could be played with and moralized. The other was isolated as a mystery too sacred for fiction. Today, purists argue that the Shoah should be kept free of any sort of imaginary treatment, especially when depicting its most terrible phase, for which we still use the tainted euphemism, final solution. The Shoah, it must be emphasized, confronts us with monstrosities that evoke feelings of improbability stronger than those arising from impossibility. They are stronger because while we accept hypoglyphs, Batman, Spider-Man, or Spider-Women, assorted vampire villains, and other venerable or newfangled monsters that transgress the laws of nature, accept them as long as they instill a truth of the heart. We do not accept transgressions perverting that truth. To build a new order, as Nazism did, to build a new order on a raison d'etat, that embraces murder, torture, and enslavement, to justify and even take pleasure in these is to mutate the image we have of our species. Terence's famous dictum, often inspiring art, that nothing human is alien to me, is challenged by the Holocaust's limit experience. The atrocities committed are so grave that the human image cannot be saved. Writers are reduced to employing stylization, indirectness, or impotent if, traumatic, if ironic voiceovers. So Paul Celan's Der, Der Tod ist ein Meister aus Deutschland. Death is a master artist from Germany. This mimics Nazi boasts celebrating a sinister achievement. The masterpiece created by a nation of Dichter and Denker, poets and thinkers, was mass murder ennobled and systematically carried out. By means of the concentration camp's alternate world, Nazism reinforced its self-image as master race and imposed the most shameful form of death on those it declared to be subhuman. Controversy then about the possibility of a truly realistic portrayal of the Holocaust will continue because the artists involved have to project a view of human behavior different from what the mind can accept and the heart tolerate. Yet mobilizing the imaginative force latent in their medium, they seek to overcome these difficulties of reception. That is why Imre Kertesz remarks provocatively, the concentration camp is imaginable only and exclusively as literature, never as reality. What I am suggesting is that Aristotle's criterion of probability has been injured by the Shoah. This, moreover, may have caused collateral damage to fiction generally. It is harder than ever to define fiction's type of truthfulness. Just think of the implication of a new literary category called a non-fiction novel. Also harder to apply is a related criterion, that of decorum. I mean, we, we read, show our literature sympathetically, but do we not have to also apply some criteria do we not have to say this is good, this is not good, or this is partially good, and this should be read, and this should not be read? How do you do that in the face of a content that is often so strong? 
So I'm now invoking the criterion of decorum, which may seem strange. Literary decorum can be understood as an art of distancing, that is, of creating space for a non-escapist thoughtfulness in both author and audience. Decorum in art is not an abstract quality or a byproduct of, well, what shall I say, of social etiquette. When Kertes enters the quarrel about Benini's life is beautiful, which he defends as a fable with its own raison d'etre, he is also defending the rights of fable, even of comedy, and so relies on the sense of that genre's decorum. Now, Life is Beautiful is not a great film, and some of Benigni's comments on his own work are inane. The movie's second part about the deportation and the camp cannot be compared, as he claims, to a tragedy. It remains within the parameters of comedy. At best, it might be called a tragic farce. We have to reject Benigni's comment. The film, relying on comedy's subversive logic, does not ask us to believe that the father's benevolent deceit masking the camp's reality could have succeeded. While defying credibility, the unreal scenes Benini invents are only as outrageous and incredible as we know the real death camps to have been. The father's game, moreover, saves the euphemistic vision that keeps hope alive in the eyes of a child. And that is the problem that we all face. What is staged by Benini is a kind of terrible childishness, a desperate remnant of hope or trust. The decorum involved, therefore, is that the film hews almost till its end to a venerable definition of comedy as a story with perilous complications that do not terrify, that do not provoke fear of death. The comic genre assumes that even if the clown dies, and you remember at the end the clown does die, the worst returns to laughter, Holocaust laughter, as Terence Depre courageously named it some years ago. Comedy's gymnastics and gyrations, its confusions and improvisations, by recalling human resilience as well as human folly, relax and vitalize its audience. We seem suddenly to have many lives, many chances to escape from the noose of the plot. In general, the amount of license permitted depends on the chosen literary genre. In older theories of decorum, subject matter and type of style were correlated. Tragedy demanded a high style, though Shakespeare's genius got away with interspersed low comedy episodes. The pure high style, as in neoclassical French tragedy, did not permit any coarse words or coarse episodes, let alone the direct depiction of death on stage. Well, where are we if we cannot depict death on stage or cannot use coarse words? A scene like that in Hamlet, where Prince and Gravedigger, you will remember that scene, where Prince and Gravedigger test their wits against each other so that not only mortality, but an uncontrolled, perhaps uncontrollable verbal dexterity levels high and low, equivocation will undo us, the Prince remarks. That kind of scene is unthinkable under the rules of the genera decendi, the genres of speech which were tightly regulated. Today, breaches of stylistic decorum or a mix of genres are standard fare. And it is not possible to prescribe an exclusively high serious treatment for certain events. Hence, an emotional as well as ethical reason for the wish to insulate the Holocaust from fiction. Comedy, moreover, not necessarily moderates outrage. It can serve to describe childlike perceptions that continue to be recorded by writers of the survivor generation who were children when disaster struck. And Aaron Appelfeld is an example of that, also Kertesz's first novel. If the suction hole of unreason, as Eva Hoffman has called it, 
characteristic of Holocaust atrocity disables the standard logic of storytelling. If we cannot make decently rational what is obscenely irrational, then a childlike perspective or the acceptance of a grotesque logic are both not just powerful defensive reactions, but renderings of an accommodation to what was the only reality the youngsters knew and had to survive. There is, in short, a generational factor, but it is not decisive. That is, part of the Holocaust writer generation did enter the camps quite young, and what they saw, they felt, had to be the reality. It was the only reality they knew. So that it, there is a generational factor, but it is not decisive. The same goes for the ethnic factor. When we consider the element of the comic or grotesque that already enters Tadosh Borowski's this, is this Way for the Gas, ladies and gentlemen, that was published in 1946, so very close to the end, after the end of the war. Here too, in Borowski, a camp inmate, not fictive, however, as in Benini's movie, retains some tenderness and humor, even if his life is imperiled all the time. True, as a non-Jew, Borowski is not automatically condemned to death. For him, too, nevertheless, one misstep, a capo's word, and death follows. The possibility also of maintaining an innocent vision or a pre-Holocaust state of mind is totally excluded compared to Life is Beautiful. Compared to that film, Borowski's stories are much more complex, shifting with surprising ease from straight-faced irony to disgust at aesthetic idealization. The tone is essentially that of an observer who maintains a measure of autonomy as he sees the human comedy acted out even in a deadly milieu. I turn now specifically to generational issues affecting literature and witness accounts in the post-war years. Here too, unfortunately this time, a universal dimension enters, a malignant or schlechte Unendlichkeit. For the Holocaust has not turned out to be the genocide to end all genocides. In fact, at this point in time, insistence on its uniqueness produces bitter awareness of a repetition. The historical circumstances or motives of each genocidal occurrence are different. different. The scope and duration are different, but the extreme brutality and suffering are overwhelmingly the same. The fact also that the Shoah was extensively recorded due to the arrogant documentation of the perpetrators, as well as a courageous schreib und verschreib, that is, write it all down, said to have been addressed to the victims by the historian Dubno, who himself was killed, distinguishes the Shoah from previous genocides. Through the writings of eyewitnesses, and what may be called secondary witnesses, still in touch with eyewitness testimony, we learn something about the lasting resonance of a collective trauma of this kind. So, still in search of criteria, I come back to Aristotle, who said that poetry was more universal than history. This judgment can be tested by reading two poets close in age yet whose historical situation is quite different. Both have achieved a certain exemplarity. And I will now soon turn to the um, sheet you, you have there, so get ready. In a few minutes, I will be there. Irving Feldman, who is not on this sheet, Irving Feldman is a secondary witness, a native of the United States, not a survivor then, yet conscious of the enormity of what happened. Dan Pagis, who is on this sheet, these are two poems by Dan Pagis, is two years young, younger and died in 1986. He came to Israel as a survivor from the Bukovina shortly after the war. He developed into a distinguished literary scholar as well as a poet. But first let me 
give you a sense of Irving Feldman because he is an American poet, because he is a secondary witness, and then compare him to Pagis. When we read in Feldman's To the Six Million, survivor, survivor, who are you? And you know, you don't know whom he is talking to. Uh, what survivor? Maybe he himself is the survivor. Who, survivor, who are you? Ask the voices who disappeared, the faces broken and expunged. I am the one who was not there. And when we read, should I have been with them on other winter days in the snow of the camps and the ghettos, and on the days of their death that was the acrid Polish air, here on the struggle ground, imposter of a death, I survive reviving. When we read this, we recognize the inheritor of a void who revives the dead as ghostly interlocutors. So many families were decimated in the Holocaust that the injury suffered becomes an injury to recollection itself. The identity quest that follows can become dangerous, even pathological, as a suicidal Esther illustrates in Henry Rasimov's Un cri sans voix, the book of Esther. Here, more generally, there is a need to research Jewishness, to try it on, as it were, so that Austria's Robert Schindel, for an instance, both exemplifies and resists the complex psychic state that Finkielkraut, Alain Finkielkraut, has characterized as the imaginary Jew. To tell the truth, Schindel confesses, to tell the truth, my roots are foreign to me. Yet this effort of remembrance in the generations after, in what has been named post-memory, retains its persistence precisely because it is not a memory based on personal and direct witness. An artificial recollection recovers details about and even intensifies with, sorry, and even identifies with the life and death of those who disappeared. And of course, that is, I would think, the situation of most of us who, are, who were not eyewitnesses that we have, that we become secondary witnesses if we follow our conscience. Feldman's secondary witness involves a clear mark, in, in, leaves a clear mark on his poems. Historical research with its cumulus of documents and facts cannot by itself fill an emotional void. Fiction, or faction as it is sometimes called, remains essential for a reparative quest that wishes to bring home to others that an entire culture was destroyed, together with millions of individuals. It is through fact feats of the, of the artistic imagination that we come into the presence of absent figures culled from the emptiness and on whom art, often aided by a miraculously preserved chronicles of the Hurban, the, word, the Yiddish word for uh, the Holocaust, bestows an identity. It bestows, that is, these chronicles, which ma many of you know about, bestow a solidity of specification which alone satisfies a modern realism, according to Henry James. Feldman's To the Six Millions is unusual because it has few topical references and does not lean on authenticating fragments from eyewitness texts, as is, in, as is customary in many post-memory poets. His poem is a general lament whose most telling moments comes when it incorporates verses from the Song of Songs that underwrite Feldman's own feelings of loss. Like the Shulamite in search of the one whom my soul loves, the poet strays through the emptied streets of his imagination, seeking to find what he cannot find. It is incongruous, this analogy between the poet's post-Holocaust quest and that of the Shulamite, but also powerful, recalling another more sacred identification of her voice as collectively Israel's own. And I ask you now to look at the two poems, uh, Roll Call and Testimony. 
Dan Pagis's The Roll Call is also focused on absence and emptiness, evoking in a strangely whimsical way the camp's daily torture ritual of the appel. The speaker suddenly subtracts himself from the count. Only I am not there, am not there, am a mistake. Turn off my eyes quickly, erase my shadow. And the Hebrew for shadow is tzeli. Suggest it is either his mental flight from a painful memory after the poet has failed to transfigure that memory or a still deeper evasion from existence into nothingness. Pagis conveys a complex mental state through a minimum of words. His preference for laconism and riddle matches his attempt at self-elision. One may have expected a greater emphasis on realistic eyewitness detail, yet Pagis focuses solely on the victim's self-disparaging state of mind. To call the officer in charge of the roll call a diligent angel is a peculiar euphemism for that angel of death. While the narrator's I am a mistake, ani ta'ut in Hebrew, playing on the banal telephone reply, wrong number, is apt because the camp inmate has been reduced to a number, and it normalizes in that way the scene against all odds through this colloquialism and points to a disturbing self-erasure reinforced by the word cell, which is the word for shadow and also, as we will see, image. In the other poem I have that was handed out, in Pagis's testimony, which is specifically about the victim's mental state in the camps, cell, shadow, echoes tselen, image, used in Genesis where mankind is created in the image of God. The victim allows himself a macabre joke. He apologizes for smoking as he sees himself ascending smoke to impotent smoke. Sorry, that should be om impotent, but it's actually smoke to omnipotent smoke, and that, of course, is a satirical reference to the the, the, the God who has no body or image. The magnificently booted SS officers are made in the image. As for him, the camp inmate, as for him, a different creator made me. The speaker expresses once more a subversive current of abjection, abjections, then in the camp, or now having survived the camp. We cannot really tell where he is, is he still in the camp, or is he now outside of the camp? What is clear that there is an objection there, a deeply dejected mood. Does this survivor still wish to survive? Roll call ends on a mood indeterminate between abjection and acceptance. I shall not want. The sum will be all right without me, here forever. Here forever are the last two words of this poem. I shall not want, a phrase that seems to say, I shall not be missed, is taken, as you will have recognized, from Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, a hymn of absolute trust and faith. Pagis's reversal of meaning is not ordinary poetic irony, since, it's, since his continued metaphor of counting and accountability is anchored in a Hebrew whose everyday use is still so recent that its sacred ancestry cannot be voided. While a relatively young vernacular Hebrew poetry grows strong in its very admixture of sacred and colloquial, think of the Ani Taut, uh, wrong number, the poet himself comes close to abnegating his own existence. An impersonality principle common to the poetics of the pre-war modernists combines with an abnegation whose motive stems from the entirely different realm of racial persecution. The one who speaks the poem disappears into the final ambiguity of here forever. In a post-war culture, 
where testimony, memoir, and biography play an increasingly major role. Why is modernist impersonality still so influential? And I'm referring primarily here as an example, a, a, a very important example to Bagis's poem. Why is modernist impersonality still so influential? It is essential to note in this respect that the poetics of impersonality are not the same after as before the Holocaust. Paul Celan and Dan Pakis, while accepting the necessity to speak as witnesses, are more deeply affected than any pre-war modernist could have been by the Shoah's depersonalizing and shaming events. Shaming both with respect to their individual fates and their general regard for humanity. Indeed, these poets were so deeply affected that speech is inhibited at its source. They nevertheless, nevertheless do not give it up, but struggle to open the way to what Maurice Blanchot called un langage autre, a language that resists falling into what the philosopher Adorno denounced as verruchte affirmation, a shameful attraction to the contaminating event. To the writers already singled out, I should add Ilse Eichinger, the most radical stylist of them all except for Celan. Her prose is often a tissue of widerständige Texturen, resistant and resistance texture. In Eichinger's The Angel, published in 1963, the writer actually mentions a Sophie who can only be the Sophie Scholl of the White Rose Resistance, also calling her, interestingly enough, Bianca, and introducing a fate-like figure who weaves an un uncooptable lifestyle, a lifestyle that cannot be seduced by any force whatsoever. After the Holocaust, its witnesses, in particular the victims, or whether they are victims or bystanders, in order to speak or write, in order to engage on those very human and often very simple facts, these, they had to respect their own survival, avoid over-identifying with the past, and so they create a distance between themselves and their experience. Fiction for these writers after the Holocaust is not fabulation. Its discipline helped, if at all, the founding of a persona, the recovery of a precarious faith in communication, in a thou, or what Maurice Halbwax called an affective community. The poetics of impersonality are adapted to that end. Today, however, we perceive the growing prevalence of a different problematic of distancing. Now distance itself is at stake. While that distance was previously achieved through psychological diversion and formalistic technique, and this is still true of Dan Pagis, now the issue of authenticity becomes acute. A double or even triple distance must be respected and overcome. Adding to the distance felt by the secondary witness, there is the sentiment shared by many writers of having abandoned or even betrayed the world of their fathers and mothers. After one or two generations, that distance already feels historical. For among many of these writers, Orthodox Jewishness itself has become secondary. The Holocaust, however, however haunting, only deepens that distance. And study and awareness of it cannot fill a void, especially when history moving on modifies the Shoah's aura of uniqueness. Auschwitz is not necessarily for the after generations, the black sun at the center of the baleful and barely comprehensible universe it revealed. Often that center is partially displaced or accompanied by a different trauma so that the Shoah is only one of two foci in an elliptical structure. Hatikwa too, the principle of hope, has to be re rehabilitated 
once the state of Israel re-enters Jewish history as a complex fate rather than the place of a happy homecoming. Now what I have done is in part to address the teachers of that literature conscious of this university's commitment to Jewish studies and Holocaust literature and coming from my own experience that um, there is a special, a special issue in the body, the growing body of Holocaust literature and in fact literature also having to do with other enormities such as what happened to the White Rose young people. So let me end with a pedagogical coda. There has been an outpouring of fictional works on the Holocaust in addition to essays, memoirs, and meditations. They should not be ignored. They are not ignored. The argument for teaching such literature comes from the very fact that it exists. What we must not do, however, is abandon our usual standards, our critical questioning of the value of particular texts because of a regard for their sensitive and hard, highly charged content. Some doubtless think that studying Shoah literature is part of a dutiful imperative to perpetuate the memory of the victims, but the challenge to our discipline is separate from that imperative. It is to understand the challenge, our challenge is also to understand how literature and art have engaged through the ages with the extreme, with what is traumatic, scarcely bearable, and the source of a dejection difficult to lift when we remember that mankind in aspect and action is supposed to express the human form divine, imago dei. To maintain in our studies a principle of hope, to understand the white rose placed alongside the memorial candles at a Yom HaShoah ceremony is an ever-present obligation. I thank you for being such good listeners. that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. 